talk to us about the growth of Web3 and what goes through your mind when you've seen that evolution and that fast pace? Well, I mean, I think one, there is a little bit of a, not just a local agenda, but a national agenda that's taking place as well. If you take a look at what Web2 has done, Web2 hasn't only sort of digitally colonized essentially people's ownership of data into the hands of these platforms. It has also specifically given this data to the hands of American platforms, right? You think about all of these countries around the world, they are dependent on Facebook, on Microsoft, on Apple, on Google. I mean, these are all American companies. And this is, has been sort of very much looked at as a problem. Some countries like South Korea or China have taken a specific policy with direction around it, but most places, including Europe, have basically effectively been colonized by these American tech giants. So what is Web3? Web3 to them is an answer to break free from that. Not necessarily to create national companies in the same interest, although that's perhaps part of the agenda, but it's also just break free from the dependency on essentially, you could call essentially foreign tech as it were, right? So you see multiple directions. You see a consumer direction broadly on the world that says, I need to own my data. I need to have digital self uh, sovereignty. I need to have my own digital rights, my property rights. And so that's one movement. But that is powered on by national interest as well that says, yes, we want this too. And by the way, this national self-interest doesn't just go into terms of what we own in our data. It also goes into areas like, you know, digital currencies, for instance, or economic frameworks, right? The power of the U.S. dollar. These are things that all relate to this topic, which is why the rest of the world, even Europe, is embracing Web3 and having progressive digital asset policies versus the U.S. for the time being not doing very much about it. Your company, Anamoko Brands, um, has investments in more than 60 AI-related startups. Mm, I want to yes. get your thoughts on what seems like, and we all know that AI has been around for a while now, but it's this recent AI attention boom. Well, first of all, I mean, Animal Brands has done over 450 investments, right? Of these, 60 of them are AI-related. And these AI-related companies, we've started investing in them back in 2018 and 2019. So we've been investing in these for quite a while. And why is that? Well, first of all, I think, most people will understand that AI is obviously very, very critically important. But in particular, I think what a lot of people sometimes don't connect is it's critically important for Web3 and blockchain. When you think about it, for instance, in games with things like NPCs, non-player characters, you don't just have dialogue with them. They're going to be essentially these quasi-digital self-sovereign sort of creatures, as it were, which you can transact and do business with. Well, what currency are they going to be transacting with? How are they going to do it? They're going to do everything in crypto. They're not going to open a fiat bank account, right? Uh, actually, when you think about it, the digitally native currency of AI is naturally going to be crypto. In fact, our expectation is that in the future, whether it's an exchange, whether it's a platform, whether it's a marketplace, AI sort of agents and, and sort, of, uh, sort of bots, as it were, are going to be the ones that are actually going to do most of the transactions on behalf of other people or other organizations. And that is one area. But the other one also has to do with digital rights. So what blockchain now allows us to do is we have the ability to now actually prove our ownership in things. Whether this is an NFT, like a board ape or a Latin sandbox, or whether maybe a digital painting, or maybe just simply the data that we've created. But what is AI actually powered by? It's powered by our data. So how do you actually prove in a scalable, fast way that this is your data? This is what blockchain matters again. And some artist makes drawings, and he needs to say, and needs to know that, wait a second, this AI used my data, so I need to be entitled to a share of that ownership, for instance, or the revenue it generates. Actually, blockchain is the best way to do that. And there's also the best way to prove that ownership. Just in the same way that today, if someone takes your Bitcoin, you can now prove, wait, that was my Bitcoin, and you can take him to court, and you can have an enforcement mechanism that you couldn't have before because digital ownership was simply not possible until blockchain came around. Ownership governance, very important to you, I know. Yes. Um, I want to turn to gaming and esports. I know gaming is something that you've been involved in yes. much of your career. Um, but now we're seeing the Asian games, Esports is, is, is a sport. Um, Singapore recently hosted the uh, esports in an Olympic event. Um, talk to us about the growth of this sector. Well, generally speaking, I think gaming is probably the fastest growing digital segment still in the world today. <clears throat> Outside, if you look at sort of numbers and what's happening in Web3, over 3.4 billion people play games today. That is essentially something like two thirds of the world's internet. That's a big number. One has to also remember that in this, maybe less than 10 or 15 years ago, that number was literally like in the hundreds of millions. So we can see that kind of growth. And it's just a matter of time before you know, this reaches even higher numbers. So that's the first part. The second thing is, it's the way our youth culture is 
sort of in, in, engaged in. So it's no longer not just about Hollywood or just about sort of the museums or the books. Gaming is actually the kind of culture. It is probably the digital culture that is digitally native. Because there's another thing about gaming as well. Gaming is a digital first culture that is influencing the physical world. When you think about the traditional forms of culture, clothing, fashion, movies, that kind of stuff, right? Theaters, they started physical and then they came into the digital world as a form of expansion, as a form of enhancement, or as a form of sort of growth, for instance. But gaming is digital first. So take a look at the companies that emerged because of gaming. NVIDIA, big AI company, one of the largest company in the world today by market cap. You know, our use of the iPhone, what made it big? Gaming, for instance. Why do we have sort of, you know, flat screen TVs or curved screen TVs, for instance, right? Why do we have such fast, uh, uh, such fast graphic cards, for instance? Why do we have uh, sort of keyboards that flash lights or these mice or this equipment that's made by companies like Razors? All of these are multi-billion dollar enterprises that, however, came from a digital first culture that was gaming because gaming was its first utility. So for us, basically, it's just a natural sort of demonstration of what it meant to, to translate yourself from what was a, let's call it, physical culture first from a digital first culture, which is why it translates naturally into Web3. So gaming is really big. And now when you look at esports, it's again a natural thing because people engage time with it. You know, you have different kinds of sports around the world that aren't necessarily just purely physical. I mean, chess is a sport of its own kind as well, for instance. You have other ways in which you can basically sort of interact. You know, things in the mind are also basically a kind of sport. Uh, but also, you know, esports athletes are actually quite fit because they have to have mental acuity. They have to be fast. They have to be really, really sort of uh, capable in their sort of physical fitness in order to compete at an athletic level. So it is a truly athletic sport. Uh, but I will say one thing. While esports has been able to grow the market and really has grown things like Twitch, for instance, and sort of YouTube, you know, the number of people that watch other people play video games on these channels is tremendous. In fact, I would say for Twitch, it's the majority of the audience. There is one weakness in esports, and that is none of the people who are engaged in esports have any ownership of the items. So we're at that first stage, right? You know, those Fortnite skins, they're not yours, right, for instance. Um, however, over time with Web3, those skins in the next generation of games are the type of assets that you can own, which means that as you have success in those games, you will actually also not only have sort of a, a, a status success, you also have a part of share in that value because you have ownership in that area. So to us, you know, Web3 and esports and gaming is a natural connection to help supercharge this opportunity. So we're very excited about it. And, you know, certainly I think you know, we're going to hit even more growth in the gaming industry, which is bigger than movies and music combined. If you look at the headlines, you know, the global economic picture has been up and down, up and down, very rocky. But what do you see when you consider what is happening uh, economically around the world? So the biggest problem I see economically in the world is this concentration of wealth, not the fact that there is wealth. If you think of the sort of growth of GDP, the growth of the economics around the world, actually, on the sort of headline numbers, things ought to be good. There is liquidity in the market. People are, have the ability to buy stuff, but there's one issue with that liquidity, which is it's concentrated by a less than 1% of the world. And why is that? Because of the traditional form of shareholder capitalism. For instance, I could be a user in Facebook. I could be a user in Apple. I contribute to its value, but I actually don't receive anything of its value. Who receives the value? The management, the founders, the team, and the investors and the shareholders of those companies, which do not represent the audience that they serve. And that has been a typical problem in the last, really, if you think about it, decades. And unlike uh, other businesses pre-technology, pre-sort of the sort of what happened with Web 1 and Web 2, for instance, the growth and concentration of that power because of data was not exponential. So you couldn't really sort of see that. So those problems that we see today with wealth inequality, even 30, 40 years ago, were simply not visible because businesses couldn't scale the way that they could as they do with technology today. So as growth scaled, Unfortunately, human capital and human labor couldn't scale the same way. So labor is no longer valuable, and essentially capital is the only thing that's really valuable over time. So that means the paradigms have to change. The paradigm has to say that people who participate in the engagement of these activities must not be wage laborers. They must become stakeholders. They must become owners in the products that they serve and build, which is why entrepreneurship has become such a big thing, because entrepreneurs build to have a stake in something they own. Right? In the same way that if you have real estate, you know, you actually have a stake in the ecosystem, as in the city or the country that you live in, and you grow from that development. But very few people do that because they don't understand it, partially because there's a lack of financial literacy. They don't teach that in kids, so they don't know that they need to own stuff. In fact, I would argue the whole gig economy with Uber and Airbnb presented one of the worst lies that we could give to our youth generation to say, you don't need to own anything. 
you can just sort of live wherever you want. You don't even own your car. You don't even own your house. Just, just, just vagabond around the world. And you know, that, I think, has been a, a great disservice. And so this, I think, Web3 can solve. Because Web3's main principle is around not just aligning incentives, but creating a way in which everyone can have a stake because they all become co-owners or part owners in the very networks that they help develop. For instance, if you buy land in Sandbox, you become a stakeholder in, in Sandbox, which means that if Sand, uh, Sandbox as an equity, as an, as, a, as an ecosystem starts to develop, you get to benefit because you help contribute to the network. And today, we don't have this in Web2. You know, all the users that create value to Facebook and value to Instagram, they should receive a small stake in what they actually help make, but they don't receive that. And that, I think, is the issue about the inequality we see in the world and how we think Web3 can solve that. Uh, and I think some countries around the world see that because they know this problem, but others, obviously, they are more trying to protect the status quo or they don't understand it. Um, or, you know, the politics around lobbying, of course, all of that relates to sort of a situation where wealth inequality stays the way that it is. Yeah, Tzu, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. We appreciate thank you. this conversation. Yes, thank you.